Hey everyone, welcome back. And today we're talking about post-millennialism. Hope you enjoyed the first one on pre-millennialism. Uh, hopefully that's got you geared up for a bit more. Okay, post-millennialism uh, is the idea that Christ would come back um, after the thousand-year reign. Now, this uh, poses um, a couple of questions, but let's just, first of all, let me go into a bit of background and see where this idea came from. Now, it does look like, out of the three positions, pre, post, and amillennialism, that post is probably the latest one, because um, some of the early second century theologians did believe in premillennialism, uh, and it looks like um, Augustus, um, uh, sorry, and it also looks like um, Augustine, uh, took the amillennial view. Um, so postmillennial uh, seems to be the later one. And some say that um, this belief came among the American Protestants who prompted uh, reformed movements in the 1850s and uh, brought about the social gospel movement. Um, Postmillennials have become one of the key tenets of a movement known as Christian Reconstructualism. And so uh, I believe within the social gospel movement in the late 1800s came um, the Salvation Army around that time. And of course, we go into World War One. It was a time where people thought the world needed to be in a better place because um, destruction was coming, really. I've also noticed that uh, post-millennialism seems to be the one that is criticised the most, actually. You'd think people who want to view it as a literal time period would criticise our millennialism. Uh, but our, our millennialism seems to, at least from what I see and what I see on the internet, uh, more popular than post-millennialism. So yes, coming back to the idea that Christ um, would come after the thousand years. Now, right away, we have to ask the question, when was the thousand years? And now, there are so many different positions on this, and really, I don't think we could fit all of this into the category of post-millennialism, to be honest. And really, to be fair, I think maybe just using those three categories, pre, post, and amillennialism, wouldn't do this justice, really, because how can we cram all the, the interpretations into those three titles? But I'll try my best here. Some see the millennial kingdom, first of all, beginning not with the resurrection of the dead, not with the second coming, but Christ's first coming here on earth, the incarnation. Now, at different points, some see it uh, when he was born, some see it when he was when he began his ministry, um, some see it when, the, when he was crucified, actually. Um, now, two things. That would get you away from viewing it in a literal thousand years, because obviously it's been uh, 2,000 years, hasn't it, since um, Jesus Christ was on this earth. So I'm okay with that, to be honest, because I, I know numbers elsewhere in Revelation are symbolic, so I'm okay with the idea that the thousand years is not a literal thousand years. Um, now, there is another point which could prove post-millennialism to be honest which is the idea that um the binding of satan it says in revelation 20 that um the angel seized the devil and chained him in a prison for a thousand years and a lot of people say well this can't be the millennial kingdom uh, I mean, that's the other thing. People say we're in the millennial kingdom right now. If if that's the case and Christ has not returned yet, we are in the millennial age. And people say, well, that can't be the case because Satan still goes around deceiving people and distorting things and destroying things. But actually, this would be more of a um, spiritual point in that when Christ died on the cross, he defeated sin and death. And because the devil, through the Pharisees, tempted him to come down, um, by ignoring all of that and going through with the plan, the devil was defeated at the cross. And so, you see, the binding of Satan would coincide other passages like Mark 3, where Jesus says, how can you go into a strong man's house and take things from him? Don't you first have to bind the strong man up? Um, and you could see that as, as an image for the devil. 
um, you bind you bind the strong man up, the angel bound the devil into the pit. Um, another passage would be 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where the man of sin, um, although I don't, although the man of sin seems to be influenced by Satan, this, this idea would see the man of sin as Satan. I've got videos on that, by the way. But, you know, it says, um, you know what is restraining him, and um, one day the restrainer will be let loose. Now, of course, you can't restrain someone who's not there, um, so in the first century when Paul was writing this, he saw the man of sin alive at that time, either the devil or an agent of the devil. But um, the restraining would also coincide with the binding of Satan. And then other Bible passages that could fit inside of this idea of binding Satan, uh, first of all, would be Colossians 2.15, which says, And having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Hebrews 2, uh, verses 14 and 15 says, Since the children have flesh and blood, have too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who... All their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Now, a lot of people don't like this idea of, yes, but he's still out there. He's still deceiving people. Well, I think it's making the point more that he was defeated at the cross. Now, of course, the sin and the bad stuff is going to happen. But ultimately, at the end of the day, victory has won. Christ has triumphed. So, um, I mean... I'm I'm okay with that idea that Christ defeated Satan and the millennium began then at the crucifixion. Now there are other ideas as well. Maybe I'll make some more videos. One idea is that the millennium began um, at the cross and went up to AD seventy, so that forty years was seen as the millennium. Uh, another idea is that the millennium began after AD seventy, after the the destruction of Jerusalem living up to where we are now but nevertheless the church age the age we live in now the age of grace rather than the law this is seen as the millennial age uh, then christ would return now one of the reasons i have noticed why people tend to not like post-millennialism is this idea of well the millennium is supposed to be a, a time of the golden age, peace, um, better days, and there's almost this attitude. Well, is this all there is? Is this as good as it's going to get? And they and the post millennialists say that it's actually through the workings of the church, the ethics of the church, that we bring about this golden age, and that we prepare the way for Christ to come back. Actually, we in our witnessing and in our being kingdom people bring about the church age now a lot of people say well this is a task that is unachievable but i must admit i favor post-millennialism actually and i'm not using this to say you've got to believe this but i think that should prompt us to do better things if i'm honest about it that should prompt us to care for the poor keep doing the good things in the name of christ and other things like caring for creation, caring for the environment. I'm totally okay with um, the millennial kingdom, kingdom being now in the days we're living in because we're meant to do our part. We're meant to make this world a better place. Now, compared to pre-millennialism, I've noticed it in a lot of end time uh, theories and a lot of people who are futurists there is this element of I've given up on the world and Christ need Christ needs to come back to fix it. He needs to come back to make things right. Well, um, you know, we live on this earth. I know this is not going to be eternity, but we do have to make the best of where, where we are right now. I do think there is this attitude of we need to leave this place which is why i can understand the rapture why a lot of people want the rapture to be true so we can get out of here but post-millennialism actually gets 
us to challenge ourselves to do a bit more. But it also does not take away that there will be a second coming of Christ. Now that's why I like post-millennialism, because it gets me inspired to do more, and it also maintains that there is a there is still a second physical, literal coming of Christ in the future. I don't know when, but he will come back. That is why I'm I'm more of a partial preterist than a full preterist, because I still see that there is going to be a second coming. Um, I know full preterists say that's already happened. So um, these are just the thoughts I have, first of all, on the post-millennial interpretation that you don't have to view it as a literal thousand years. Um, there is still a second coming of Christ. And um, rather than seeing it as, oh, is this all there is, this world, in, let inspire you, let let. Let it help you do more for the kingdom, because isn't that what what we're meant to do as the church, to make the world better, to serve it, to help people? So, hey, thank you so much. This is my thoughts on post-millennialism, and uh, stay tuned for the next one, our millennialism. Take care.